<coughs> so this is lecture 21 and in this lecture I'm going to review Yangle's theory once more. I did a brief survey of it a few weeks ago but it deserves to have a lot of time spent on it. It is more or less the entire basis for what we, how we understand elementary particle physics. So there's really no point skipping it or, or going through it quickly. And so I decided that uh, we'll go through it carefully again and iron out any questions or misconceptions you may have. So <coughs> the idea is, uh, <coughs> imagine that we want uh, so we have studied theories with, we have studied global SUN symmetry. Uh, in which, for example, a field matrix valued field goes to U phi U inverse, preserving the Lagrangian. And the way the Lagrangian gets preserved is that there's a, some function of lot of phi's like del mu phi, del mu phi or phi, some power of phi. And then there's a trace. And inside the trace, is, uh, you, we use the cyclic property to cancel out all the u's. Is that point at least, is that clear? I think people have got that because that's from the first part of the course. I think it was made clear then. So now the idea is, can we extend this? kind of symmetry to the local case. That means u, the matrix, should be an arbitrary function of x. Now clearly if matrix is made an arbitrary function of x, then this transformation is not going to keep a scalar field theory Lagrangian invariant. You can easily check that. What goes wrong when we make a matrix like U to be an arbitrary function of X is that when we have del mu phi, then we get an extra term when that del mu acts on U or on U inverse. And that term won't go away just by itself. So we have to be a little bit more clever. So <coughs> secondly, uh, so, so it means that it's not going to just work if we have scalar fields. So let's try something else. Uh, also, we know from past experience that in the abelian case of local symmetry, we have the gauge invariance of ordinary electrodynamics and that crucially involves a vector field rather than a scalar field. There may be also scalar fields in electrodynamics and fermions, but the vector field plays a key role. That I think again point, point is well uh, understood and appreciated. Did I ever start the video? Again, I'm, yeah, okay. I think this is going to happen every time now. It's a mental block. Okay. So, uh, we should have a vector field <coughs> in order to achieve local gauge symmetry. This is, this is a kind of intuition. Now, uh, last time I discussed Yang-Mills theory, I actually described for you the intuition of Yang and Mills. Today I am not going to do that. That's now uh, going to be an appendix in the notes. And I'm just going to give you the Yang-Mills theory as a set of rules. Uh, we are not going to focus too much time on how it came or why it came. If you're interested in that, please read the appendix and then read Yang and Mills's paper. But I'll just give you a very brief motivation. So there should be a vector field A mu and corresponding to it, a field strength. F menu, but right now we are not sure what these two things should, I mean, what should be the expression of F menu in terms of A or how A should transform. However, again by analogy, we would like the Lagrangian to be expressed in terms of F. And I'm going to write the Lagrangian, I'm going to demand that there is a Lagrangian like this because it reminds us of the Lagrangian of Maxwell theory, which is the abelian case. The new feature is the trace. 
and also that instead of one quarter we have a half but that actually turns out to be because the generators of this sun are normalized so that their square is uh, a half okay so um, <coughs> uh, the trace of their square is a half actually if you look at pauli matrices divided by 2 the square is 1 by 4 and then the trace of that is 2 by 4 which is half so that extra half comes from that we'll see it later so uh, i want this okay and so this is what i want and also another thing i want is that the infinitesimal variation of f should be a commutator um, minus the commutator of f with some parameter theta this one is by analogy with scalar field theory where we already have seen such infinitesimal variations okay but again theta is going to be the parameter that depends on x and the relation between u and theta will be that u is the finite transformation and theta is the infinitesimal transformation okay uh, I hope those words were not misunderstood. I am not trying to say that theta has to be infinitesimal. I am saying that uh, if we want the infinitesimal transformation, we should take theta to be small and then expand to lowest order in theta. If we don't want infinitesimal, then we can take theta to be anything and write everything in terms of u. Okay? Both these things you need to know, the infinitesimal as well as the finite transformations, so the calculus, the steps are slightly different so you need to know them so we want this because if we have this then it implies that delta l is equal to zero if l is that and f transforms this way then the variation of l is automatically zero because each of these under variation by turn gets replaced by this commutator but everything is inside a trace and when you expand out the trace you'll find zero is that clear Please, if you have any doubts, ask now. Hmm? The purpose of this lecture is to make it absolutely clear. So, if you have the slightest doubt, just ask. Anything I can explain again about this? Yeah. I said, if we propose a Lagrangian like this and a transformation law like this, then under this, necessarily this Lagrangian must be invariant. Because if we do the calculation, so let's, so I think by repeat you mean I should do the calculation. I'll do it. So delta L, that's uh, L. So I have to either vary this or that. That means vary delta F times F or F times delta F. Both terms I have to take. But they are the same because under the trace I can invert the order. So therefore the 2 will go and I'll get minus trace of F mu nu delta F. So far so good. Okay. Now this is, now I plug in this because this is delta F mu nu. So I get I trace of F mu nu, F mu nu, theta. So it's the trace of this times the commutator. So far so good? Okay. What is this trace? It's I times two terms trace of F mu nu f mu nu theta <coughs> minus trace of f mu nu theta f mu nu. Still good? I expanded this commutator. Okay. Now the trace has a property that I can so trace of a b is equal to trace of b a. Okay, so here I am going to treat <coughs> what? Uh, this as A, these two, and the last one as B. So it means I can bring this to the front. But if I do that, this term becomes minus trace of F, F theta. Okay, and this is the same as this, they cancel. Therefore, this transformation law will definitely leave this in with. Okay, but we don't have a Lagrangian yet because F cannot be treated as a fundamental field. Okay, 
it's like saying I have a scalar field and I write the Lagrangian trace of phi squared. That's no, there's no fun in that. There should be some derivatives in the Lagrangian in order to have a second order equation of motion and get some physics out of it. Okay, And that means that F has to be expressed in terms of a more fundamental field A. This is clearly by analogy with electromagnetism where the field strength is expressed in terms of the vector potential A and it's the vector potential which is the fundamental field, not the field strength. Okay, it's that which we vary when we want to find equations of motion. So, from this saying that this is the Lagrangian and this is the transformation of F is a nice idea, but it's not yet a result. It will be a result if now I can find F in terms of some A and tell you how to transform A such that F transforms in this way. Then it will be a result. Okay, and how do I do that? So, Let's start by proposing an A. <coughs> it's also a matrix like F. By the way, I forgot to say, but F is Hermitian. And optionally, you can take it traceless. Okay, a Hermitian matrix is in the Lie algebra of UN. If it's also traceless, it's in the Lie algebra of SUN. Uh, I've explained all this a few times. Mm -hmm. But if you want me to explain that also, I can do it, but you'll have to ask me and I'll do it in a separate lecture if you really need uh, that thing again. But for now, so we'll take it Hermitian. Now you could do other things. For example, you might want to realize the Lie algebra SON, which is a completely different Lie algebra. Then you have to make different choices. You have to say that F is real and anti-symmetric as a matrix and then uh, things are a little bit different. But for Hermitian is a standard case and I won't require you to know anything beyond that and that's the case which of uh, SUN or UN, the difference between the two being the trace part. Note by the way that when uh, we have a transformation like F goes to U, F, U inverse, then um, if u has a u1 part, that means it's a pure phase times the identity, then this just acts completely trivially. So actually the only thing that acts here is sun part of un. That's why we keep reducing un to sun. Okay? In such a commutator action, the u1 part of un doesn't do anything. Is that clear? Okay. Good. Okay. So we have, so we have this a which is also Hermitian like f. And the first thing we need to know is what is F in terms of A? And the, well, the first, okay, there are two things we need to know. What is delta A mu? And what is F mu nu as a function of A? These are the two things. And we know the answers in the abelian case. Delta A mu for the abelian case is del mu of some parameter alpha. And F mu nu is del mu A nu minus del mu A mu. That's the abelian case. But we are doing something new, so we have to do some guessing. And the first puzzle is that there are two natural choices for delta A mu. One is we remember the abelian case and say, well, why shouldn't it be del mu of some parameter theta? That's how it worked in the abelian case. So now we make this a matrix, that a matrix, and keep the same relation. It's one option. Hmm? There's another option. A is a matrix. All matrices transform like this, whose infinitesimal form is theta, basically commutator with theta. So why don't I transform A mu by saying that it is something like A mu commutator theta. This has no analog in the abelian case because A and theta there were just numbers, so they commute. But it does have an analog in the case of global symmetry. In global symmetry, this is how scalar fields, for example, transform. We already know that. We have studied scalar fields with global symmetry for a month. And in that study, we encountered matrix-valued scalar fields, which transform like this. And we also encountered matrix-valued spinner fields. They also transform like this. So now we have, for the first time, a matrix-valued vector field. It should also transform like this. So we have two options. Which one is correct? Okay, is it clear that we have two options and why? Both are by analogy. 
this is by the non abelian but global symmetry this is abelian but local symmetry now we are trying to do non abelian local symmetry so we have two inspirations which we already are familiar with and we are trying to combine those inspirations okay well it turns out the correct answer is the linear combination of both of these so both of these and in fact we so now there's certain convention dependence that's why i consult my notes 1 over g del mu theta plus i sorry minus i uh a mu theta this is the linear combination it's quite general it may look like i've chosen some coefficients why is it general because um i've just chosen first of all uh, i is very good here because if i have two matrices which are hermitian the commutator is not hermitian the commutator is anti hermitian because of the minus sign in the commutator if i have ab minus ba i take the dagger i get ba minus ab which is opposite of what it was so with the i it becomes hermitian again and if a is hermitian and this term is hermitian then this term must also be hermitian so the i is needed <coughs> the minus sign is a convention some textbooks actually use plus i'm just picked one and g is a constant which gives me a allows me to have a different amount of this and this so it's it's an arbitrary constant so it's like choosing two different coefficients for these two yes so at this point in the notes you mentioned the uh, line that it is a well known fact of the algebra that a transformation Uh, acts on the fundamental representation by ah, multiplication yeah. by the same yeah. on the commutator. Yeah. Can you explain that? Uh, <coughs> okay. Okay. Uh, but that goes into this whole business of adjoint representation versus fundamental, and I want that will take some time. Um, uh, let's do one thing then. Uh, for now, let's uh, agree that this is the transformation, and which is equivalent to commutator in the infinitesimal. By the way, this thing is though it is not a commutator, but it's called a commutator in group theory language, multiplying by u on one side and u on inverse on the other. So this uh, is a transformation uh, typical of the adjoint representation of a Lie algebra, and we'll simply assume that our um, <coughs> non abelian gauge theory as fields which transform in the adjoint representation it turns out that is true okay that is normally what matrix valued fields do okay in the beginning of this course we did vector models and matrix models so the vector models transform in the vector model okay so maybe i'm answering shyan's question in the vector model i had phi i it goes to u i j phi j i hope you remember these models so of course this is what i mean by acting with left uh, by left multiplication it just phi goes to uij phi j so rotation of phi but in the matrix model i have a phi a scalar field with two indices i and j and it goes to u phi u inverse ij which is uik phi kl u inverse l j if i want to expand out everything okay so this is what i mean by saying that it acts like a commutator okay so the difference between the vector model and the matrix model is the difference between a fundamental representation field and a adjoint representation field of the same group why same group because it is the same u which are acting in both cases and i can have lagrangians which combine fields of this type and fields of this type or they have only fields of this type or only fields of this type there are many options and they do arise in nature the standard model makes use of these type of fields for the uh, higgs field and for the electron field and the quark field uh, but it makes use of um, non abelian gauge fields uh, so in some sense both representations arise yes 
There are many models in the, 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 there's just a statement that there are many different kinds of, huh, so how do we know which representation to choose, is that the question? Very good. So actually in the early days of the standard model, nobody knew and people had to make guesses and the guesses came out, often came out wrong. So for example, one school of thought was that the, so SU2 was thought to be part the weak interaction gauge group for reasons which I won't explain here, but which started with Glasha's work of the early 1960s. And now the question was if SU2 <coughs> is the gauge group, which representation do we want? The matrix representation, which is actually a triplet, uh, or the vector representation, which is a doublet. In SU2 language, the uh, vector representation is the spin half, and the matrix one is spin one. So which one do we want? So well, we have a few particles in nature, some electron, neutrino, positron. And so people tried to put electron, neutrino, and positron as one triplet. So it turns out in the structure of the standard model, the charge increases as I go downwards. Uh, and so this is charge minus one, charge zero, and charge plus one. So this would have been an adjoint multiplet of SU2, but this wasn't the correct answer. The correct answer was only this, and it's actually a doublet. And there's a, co there's a complex conjugate doublet, which is nu bar and E plus, where the positron and the antineutrino sit. That's a separate doublet. So these are all things you have to figure out by trial and error, connecting nature to field theory. It's not something given to you. <coughs> and uh, you know, nature could have any representation of SU2 appearing, but it only uses simple ones. Fortunately for us, you know, only the doublet and triplet actually appear in field theory. Of course, higher representations of SU2 do appear. Since you have studied angular momentum in quantum mechanics, you can have a atom or a system with any angular momentum, multiple of half, so half, one, three, half, two, and so on. And all of those are different representations of SU2, and they are all independent. They are all irreducible representations. So all sizes of representation exist. <coughs> the nice thing is that the fundamental and the adjoint only can both be described using a 2 by 2 matrix U, except that here it acts by commutator and here it acts by left action. Okay, so why uh, here, why do we say it's a two-dimensional representation? Because J takes the values one and two, and this, that makes this a two by two matrix, okay? So there are two of these phi's in SU2. But here, phi is a Hermitian traceless matrix. So a Hermitian matrix two by two should have four components, real, traceless removes one, so we get three. If you do the same count for any SUN, you'll find this has N and this has N squared minus one components. And these are the two lowest dimensional irreducible representations of SUN. So it's actually very convenient that for those two representations, we can just keep the same use but act by the left multiplication or by the commutator, uh, depending on whether phi is a vector or a matrix. <coughs> it's just a, a trick which simplifies our life because the use that we need are only always two by two. In principle, you can rewrite these matrices uh, with three by three matrices acting on them. Okay, I'll do that for you later. I think I better not go into too much of that. But you're taking a group theory course, and I'm hopeful that all this will come out in your course at some point. Either taking or taken. Some of you have taken, I think. No? Yes. And you did these things, or? Yes. Now, the one that's going on now. Okay. Yeah, it, it's fair. I mean, the Lie, Lie groups and Lie algebras comes it's really a second half of a group theory course, so it's reasonable that you start it now. Good. Sir? Yes. Yes. Uh, are there model independent signatures of the underlying gauge group in the physical quantities that we measure? You know, nothing is model independent. We have to actually make a prediction and then measure. There is nothing that uniquely leads to a particular, that from a measurement back to a particular theory. Uh, but if you are clever, you know, within some framework, there might be a way to find there. For example, there's a very famous way to uh, find out the number of quarks in nature, which is that you scatter electron positron and rank, uh, ramp up the energy. And as soon as that scattering can produce quark-antiquark pairs, then you get a 
rise in the cross section when it produces u u bar u and u bar d and d bar then c and c bar s and s bar it keeps going up because there are more and more quarks available to produce so you count the number of those things and you find that there are six quarks in nature <coughs> that's an example of how you can have a very good signature from experiment about some number in your model but it's not always like that <coughs> okay let me go on with this so we've concluded something important that i I've, I've postulated that the variation of a looks like that and now my job is to find an f so there are a couple of problems i have to know the I, there are two problems right this one and this one so i proposed a solution to that now i have to propose a solution to this what is f in terms of a then i have to put these two proposals together and show that the end result is this variation of f then i'm happy hmm? so this is the chain of thought so for f <coughs> again we have some guesswork involved so we say well since it's a field strength of a gauge field by analogy it should certainly have these terms but it's certainly allowed to also have more and we expect more because after all if there's a free parameter here there should be a free parameter in f the same free parameter should be there and now it's a matter of trial and error when i say dot dot i mean terms which could be of order a squared a cubed a fourth whatever because these are the linear terms okay so we try and we find that actually the second order term fits very well because i take a mu and a nu so there are two indices like f and nu i take their commutator so now it's anti symmetric just like this term and f mu nu itself and i just put a g in front and that's it actually i put a minus ig as i told you the commutator always needs an i with it to make it hermitian and this pair of things is exactly what works so now we have to i'll show you that it works and works means that when i vary a in this in this line f will vary like this Uh, okay, so we want to calculate delta f. Now there's a very beautiful property of this field strength. First of all, note that it's linear plus quadratic. So if I vary it, this will vary, this will vary, and in this term, either I vary this times that, or I vary, I keep that fixed and vary this. That's how I do infinitesimal variation of anything. So there are four terms. and they are delta mu delta del mu delta a nu minus del nu delta a mu plus minus ig delta a nu commutator a nu minus ig a mu commutator delta a nu this is an arbitrary variation at the end i will put in this variation but actually this is going to be useful even uh for general variations so i'm going to just simplify this so i'll notice that i can combine this in the following way take this term and the last term okay so that becomes <coughs> del mu delta a nu Minus i g a mu delta a. Mu. Okay, you agree that's the first and last term. What about the other terms? Uh, well, I'll flip the order of these two, getting a plus sign, and I'll see that the these two terms are nothing but those two terms after exchanging u with nu. Okay. and this first one is something we have seen before this quantity we often call d mu theta where d mu is the operator act with derivative and then subtract ig times commutator of a with that thing and you can see here 
that this is d mu this first line is d mu of delta i mu the same covariant derivative d just in place of theta we put in delta i yeah and the other term is minus the reverse now why is this so nice this says that even though f has some non linear term and it's not exactly what the abelian theory had but an infinitesimal variation of f can be cast in the form of something roughly like the abelian it's like a curl of delta a hmm? De del mu of it minus the reverse but the derivative is not the ordinary derivative it's a derivative which is carrying along with it a commutator and that's good because the commutator is the special feature of matrix valued fields you can't have a commutator for ordinary numbers because it's zero so for there to be a com for when there are matrices you can have a commutator and it turns out that commutator part is necessary uh, that that comes from the fact that these terms were necessary in f so these terms which we had to add uh, amount to giving me these uh, these extra commutators and that's how we get this formula so it's a very important formula yeah yes uh, first yeah sir i think that is a plus sign in the last term delta uh, mu which one uh, the first line we did for the variation this one no this one yeah yes the last term in that no i have no i have taken minus ag minus ig a mu a mu and first i varied this times that and then i kept this and varied that so it wasn't the commutator won't there be a minus sign no there no there's no minus sign this is these signs are correct variation of let's write the general formula variation of x comma y which are two matrices is variation of x comma y uh, plus x comma variation of y <coughs> there are not there's no sign in that just expand it out and you'll see that it's true this is variation of xy minus yx so we get delta xy then we get minus y delta x then we get x delta y and we get it's no this is correct hmm? however the reason why i was able to make this minus of mu going to nu was that this term is not in the form my covariant derivative has in my covariant derivative a is first and delta a is second so i flip this to get a first and delta a second then i get a plus sign then this combines with that to make minus the covariant derivative it's all very tightly constrained system yeah so uh, i don't understand why do we call it the covariant derivative like why do the derivative define from that del a mu yeah like i see when i first thing like in gr like yeah. why we call it the covariant yeah. like what's the connection yeah it's uh, you said it it's the connection a covariant derivative is a derivative with a connection in this case the yang mills field a is the connection in gr the christoffel symbol is the connection and in gr the job of a covariant derivative is to map a tensor to a tensor and in this case the job of it is to map an object which transforms in a nice way under the non abelian group namely this u f u inverse way to another object which transforms the same way so it preserves the group symmetry in both cases so it's really the same concept and in both cases actually it's nothing but math what mathematicians call connection on a principal bundle so in language of fiber bundles these two are similar though they are different fiber bundles but the idea of this covariant derivative is the same and yang himself who was um my head of department in stony brook for 5 years when i did my phd uh, used to talk a lot and he has written a lot about the importance of fiber bundles in understanding yang mills theory as well as gravity and the fact that it unifies both these fields so in gravity the principle is principle of equivalence in this the principle is non abelian gauge symmetry and formally there is a lot of similarity both are local <laughs> symmetries principle of equivalence says i can choose a frame a different frame independent accelerated frame which is like choosing a frame with a different velocity at each point so so that's like a local local symmetry so it does unify these and that's why it's called covariant derivative and you should look out for them because they have very nice properties 
okay let's not uh, get distracted from our goal we've reached this far and we want to get here okay so now we have to evaluate this thing but the good thing is we, we only need to evaluate the first term after that we'll just write minus mu goes to nu i think many of you know how to do that because i think even in your mid sem you wrote many of you wrote expressions like some tensor with mu and nu and then minus the reverse so now we'll say delta f mu nu is d mu delta e nu minus mu goes to nu and this is a very good thing to do because now i only have to calculate one thing and then i can when i manipulate it to its final form then i'll add that okay also very important while manipulating this if i find any contribution which is symmetric in mu and nu i can drop it right there because it's going to cancel with its friend from the other side and we'll see that will happen so we are going to calculate d mu delta e nu this is an arbitrary variation ah so now actually we can't get any further without saying what is delta e nu there nothing really to calculate so now we are going to implement in this uh that so actually i should have written it sorry now i should use the fact that delta e nu is d nu of theta up to here this was general and we'll be using this again so let me just keep it for now now it's going to be d nu theta there's a 1 by g okay so i actually want d mu d nu theta minus the reverse is it clear d mu of delta e nu but delta e nu was d nu of theta so it's d mu d nu theta and then minus the reverse so what is d mu d nu theta that's all we need here also related to shine's question and nice analogy with general relativity comes in if you take the commutator of two covariant derivatives in gr you get a riemann tensor if you take the commutator of two covariant derivatives here you will get f that's all we have to prove and once we do that then it will follow that the variation of f is f times theta commutator and that's what we are trying to prove so but let's do it very slowly so what is d mu d nu theta well uh, it is del mu of um then i i use this this has two terms del and then a commutator this also has two terms del and a commutator so like this uh and then minus ig and now we get a double commutator okay i simply put in the definition of the covariant derivative but it's twice so this d nu theta is this whole thing as well as this whole thing it should be nu and then i just put a d mu on it and i get all these terms so let's expand them and write them all out the first term is del mu del nu theta this should make me very happy why symmetric so i can already forget it because i'm going to subtract the same thing with mu and nu reversed and it will cancel so already i anticipate that it will cancel the subsequent terms are this del mu must act on this or it must act on that by distributivity of differentiation so del mu a nu theta minus ig a nu del mu theta this much all these three terms are just these two terms hmm? del mu acting on this or del mu acting on that then i have a few more terms minus ig a mu del mu theta this is from this and this and then minus i times minus i which is minus and g squared and now i have a nested commutator a mu a nu theta 
so five terms now is there something we can throw away because it's symmetric well the first term we threw away do you see anything else which we can throw away this term and this term this term and this term because these two terms are together symmetric under exchange of mu and nu so when i interchange mu and nu to add that part they'll both cancel what will actually happen is the new mu version of this will cancel that and the flipped version of that will cancel this but they'll cancel so i have only two terms and things are getting better so let's work on those two terms so those two terms are so what we are evaluating is d mu d nu theta and the two terms are minus ig del mu a nu comma theta one term and the last term minus g squared a mu a nu theta good so going smoothly so far <clears throat> and of course i have to uh, eventually subtract the other part so therefore the reverse so delta f will be 1 over g times all this minus its reversed so i'm going to write it as minus ig here i'll combine this with its reverse so this is this term minus its reverse so i simply put the reverse there the mu nu reverse hmm now staring at it does it make us feel good we are trying to get this let me say by the way since i have looked at your midsem papers there's no shame in trying to guess what the answer is and can and try to go in that direction if you know what the answer is ha ah, there were problems i have given you where i told you what the answer is and said show it there's no harm in using that answer to show it you don't have to derive from first principles okay if i say find the solution of this equation you have to find it but if i say show that this is the solution of this equation put the solution in the equation if it solves the equation you have shown it so same thing we are trying to show that this is true and we have shown this much plus some more terms so is this going in the direction or it's not is going in that direction beautifully because f has two terms which are exactly those and if you compare this g cancels and we have minus i it's absolutely fantastic so the last one has to work hmm please have faith that when you see these kind of signs they are signs from somebody upstairs telling us that is going to work hmm you must have that faith now what's the last term minus g squared and we have two things so i'll sorry there are a lot of brackets so this i can remove i'm putting the new new reverse things explicitly so i have a mu with a new theta and i should subtract a new with a mu theta that's the full answer okay and now the question is these two terms are they going to obligingly sum up to the quadratic term of f commuted with theta which is a a with a comma a commutator i think it's gone away with theta well you see that there are two uh, double commutators now do you know of an identity satisfied by double commutators yeah. in matrix or jacobi identity okay. everyone knows this identity mm -hmm. no shame in not knowing it if you don't know it i will tell you now then you will know it for rest of your life it's a fantastic identity yes okay. good thanks let's do it so any 3 n cross n matrices i just said n cross n so that they are all of the same size otherwise i shouldn't be multiplying them in the first place satisfy the matrices i'll give them some names m1 m2 and m3 hmm okay. i should put that thing underneath to show they are matrices but i'm getting tired of that so you'll have to remember that they are matrices they satisfy the identity 
M1, M2, M3. So commutator of these two and then commutator with M1 plus M2 commutator with M3, M1 plus, I'm sure you can guess the last term, M3 commutator of M1 with M2, just cyclic. This is 0. Now it's a funny thing, it's a deep identity, but it's also a trivial identity for matrices. How will we prove it? We just expand everything. M2, M, M3 commutators, M2, M3 minus M3, M2. Right? That's two terms. Then M1 commutator with that is M1 commutator, M2, M3, etc., etc. Then commutator of A with BC, you know how to expand out. So you just write everything. Okay? We'll get four terms, four terms, four terms. And when you stare at these 12 terms, they will cancel in pairs. End of Jacobi identity. It's always true. Any matrices, nothing to do with Lie, nothing to do with even Lie groups. Uh, these don't even have to be Hermitian or invertible. Or it's just pure, pure algebra, pure matrix algebra. Okay, and so this is called Jacobi identity. And sometimes it's not easy to see how it's going to work, because if you look at this, there's a minus, not a plus. Okay, but then you have to realize that these permutations have to be cyclic. That means if I have 1, 2, 3, then I must have 2, 3, 1 and 3, 1, 2. Now in my mind, if I take this as 1, this and as 2 and this as 3, then this is 1, 2, 3, but this is 2, 1, 3, not cyclic. So I can rewrite this, so I can rewrite this pair of terms. So let's do it. So a mu, a nu theta, the second term, I am going to make it again cyclic. How do I do, do that? I simply exchange theta and a mu with a plus sign. Any commutator, I can exchange both the terms and get a plus sign. And now nu theta mu is the same order as this cyclic permutation of this. So plus a nu theta a mu. Okay, this is what I want. And finally, I'll put a minus g squared in front. And this, now I can use the Jacobi identity, is minus of the last guy. What's the last guy? This must be equal to minus of. So, mu, nu, theta, nu, theta, mu. Now, the last one must be theta, mu, nu. So, it's minus theta commuted with a mu, a mu. By Jacobi identity. Okay. Therefore, I can, sorry, I'm just keeping this boxed equation because I will need it in a minute. Well, do you remember this equation? I can use it later. After, for five minutes, you'll remember it. So, this is equal to 1 by g <coughs> minus ig, this stuff which I'm not going to rewrite, this is the first line. And then minus g squared, now it will be plus g squared, this. Because of this minus, I got plus g squared theta <coughs> a mu a mu. Okay. But now I notice that this is theta commu commuted with something, while here I have something commuted with theta. So I can again interchange theta with this pair and pick up a minus sign. So now I get the pair first and later theta. And if I combine all this, I get precisely minus i f minimum exactly as can. And that's the proof that f transforms this way if a transforms by d mu of theta. Okay. But we already proved that if f transforms this way, then trace of f squared is invariant. So, Yangman's theory is gauge invariant. Now, it might look like this was long. And actually, it is a bit long only because we need to understand matrices. If you do it in components, it's actually shorter and it's just a little tedious with indices, but it's not uh, so difficult. And it's what I asked you to do in the mid-sem. I appreciate it might have taken time, but um, 
actually people did pretty some people did pretty well in spite of everything uh, you have to sort of learn to find your way through these calculations they are not always simple but if you are very systematic you can do them so here is a systematic description of how the gauge invariance of yang mills works in the matrix language okay now one by product of what we have done which is very nice and beautiful is the equation i asked you to remember delta of f mu nu is equal to d mu delta a nu minus d nu delta a nu where else could this relation be useful if delta a is completely arbitrary then i can use this to get the equations of motion and for that i have to remember that there are two ways to think of the equations of motion i can either vary the lagrangian then i have to vary separately a and derivatives of a there are two terms or i just vary the action then i just have to vary a and do partial integration as necessary turns out this is tailor made for varying the action so delta s is minus integral d for x trace trace is very very important f mu nu let me put these indices up delta f mu nu there was a half it went because i can vary either of these and they give me the same thing now this is minus integral d for x trace of <coughs> and f is here and here i have d mu delta a mu okay now i could put the reverse term but since f is anti symmetric this is automatically anti symmetrized so i can just put a 2 here okay good so it's looking nice now i have to somehow remove this delta a and get an equation of motion but for that i have to do an integration by parts now an interesting question for an ordinary derivative i know it can go there with a minus sign can a covariant derivative also hop around with a minus sign is that true how does that work okay and for that we have an identity which says yes and the identity is that supposing i have two functions x and y and i have x d mu y <coughs> yes where will it come from the definition of the word derivative no because it's not an ordinary derivative and it's the ordinary okay it does come if you really are prepared to formulate your calculation in language of fiber bundles but if you are not then you shouldn't assume this it can also go wrong you can apply it in places where it's not justified but first let's write an identity trace of x d mu y for any functions x and y plus trace of d mu x times y there is no commutator here it's just product x times d mu y d mu x times y is equal to ordinary derivative times trace of x y you see it's uh, quite interesting why uh, on the right side i couldn't have a covariant derivative because this is already a gauge invariant thing if x and y transform by this u u inverse then the trace is already gauge invariant we don't need a covariant derivative acting on an invariant thing it only acts on matrices themselves here it's acting on the matrix y here it's acting on the matrix x now how do i prove this identity can you guess it's almost trivial you expand it out the commutators exactly so i expand out d mu it's del mu okay so the del mu part of d mu and the del mu part of d mu here together give me the answer now there are two more terms a mu commutator with y and a mu commutator with x but crucially they are all inside a trace where i can use that cyclic property and so both the commutators cancel just between these two terms and they don't appear at the end so this identity would not be true without a trace you might apply it unthinkingly without a trace and it would be wrong then the commutators don't cancel okay so it's crucial that you have a trace and then this identity is true and this tells me that this quantity here is plus 2 integral d for x trace of d mu f mu nu delta a nu plus a term 
which would have been an overall ordinary derivative outside the trace and because I am integrating overall space time and my fields fall off at infinity that term is 0 like any term total derivative term falls off uh, under partial integration <coughs> that is gone. So, this is just minus of this. So, with the minus I get the plus <coughs> and now it is easy to this is the variation of the action. So, what is the equation of motion d u mu f mu mu equals 0. So, the equation of motion of yang Bell's theory is also written in the language of covariant derivatives and what is this? It is del mu f mu nu minus i g a mu commutator f mu nu equals 0. And what happens if I ignore the, if I have an abelian, uh, if I specialize to the abelian case, these are not matrices, they become numbers, they commute, that term drops out and this is the Maxwell equation, free Maxwell equation, del mu f mu nu equals 0. So, it generalizes the free Maxwell equation by nonlinear terms. What nonlinear terms? Turns out f is linear and quadratic in A. So, this is quadratic and cubic. Hmm? So, a term which would have been linear, uh, this also has a quadratic term in it. So, there is linear, quadratic, quadratic, cubic. So, it is a much more difficult equation than free Maxwell equation. Maxwell equation is complicated only when we have sources. Hmm? Here the yang Mills theory I have not coupled to a source, I can but I have not done it. So, I expect the source free equation, but it is already a non-linear equation and it is already a very interesting equation. And the study of solutions to yang Mills equations is actually a well posed and interesting mathematics problem. Hmm? We do not know general solutions, but we have to talk about boundary conditions, we have to talk about whether it is Euclidean theory or Lorentzian signature theory and the answers are different in all the cases, but it is a non-linear partial differential equation. So, and it, it has a nice property that it comes from this kind of thinking. So, it, it comes from studying local gauge. We only assume local gauge invariance and all these things including the final answer just popped out of it. It is very profound. Yes, question. So, you were thinking that uh, for, uh, in this theory we have some uh, cubic terms, quadratic terms yes. in AMU. Yeah. So, if we try to solve it vertebratively, yes. does that act like a self force? Yeah, yeah. I mean you can do that. You can solve it recursively I think you are saying. Uh -huh, yeah. So, what I can do is I can take a solution of the linearized equation, mm -hmm. then I can plug that into the quadratic term and so I can perturb around the linearized solution and I can try to build up solutions. Yeah, there is a whole, that is a whole field of study. But I do not think those are the most interesting ones. The ones which intrinsically use the non-linear nature of these equations are the most interesting ones. And I will stop now, I am out of time, but I will just give you uh, some names. So, two major developments happened roughly in the mid 1970s. Uh, I have no idea whether we will succeed in covering them in this course, but you should know anyway. One was the um, I do not know in which order it was, but one was the magnetic monopole and the people who discovered it were independently these two people, both uh, among the most brilliant living theoretical physicists and the instanton, the yang Mills instanton. And this is also Polyakov, so it is actually uh, BPST, these are all Russian, I think Belovin, Polyakov, Schwartz and Kipkin. I may not have all the names right, but P is definitely again Polyakov. And uh, the key difference is that this was done, uh, this requires coupling to a scalar field. So, it is not a solution of pure Yang Mills. This on the other hand does not require a scalar field, but it uh, arises only in imaginary time. So, it is a, it's a solution of the imaginary time angles act, uh, equations, which has some subtle differences. And both of these have important physical meaning. So, this one actually apparently gives a yang mills field, which has the appearance of a magnetic monopole. But it is a very subtle question why we call it a monopole and I cannot answer that today. So, if at all we have time, we might get to it later. 
but just to say that this is mid 1970s when the field really started to grow when people looked at the yang with this equation and said what can we do with it can we find some interesting solutions so i'll stop here are there any questions so yeah gauge fixing works completely analogous no. gauge fixing works uh, not completely analogously but yes analogously and we have to discuss that at some point uh, it's not completely analogous because uh, in the maxwell case the theory was linear the gauge fixing condition we chose was linear here you have a choice of linear or non linear gauge fixing terms so it's up to you how to fix the gauge to some extent and both have their value so it's more there are more options just to give you an example one could impose like lorentz gauge here you could impose uh, ordinary del mu on a mu equals 0 but you could also choose covariant del mu on d mu on a mu equals 0 they give you two different gauge fixings <coughs> actually i'm not sure they do but in principle you can have non linear gauge fixing terms so there are more options and the number of uh, independent polarizations that remain are two n Yes, uh, they are. Uh, they are. They are exactly two n. That's still true, unless there is spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is the subject of tomorrow's lecture onwards. Then things are a little different. For the pure theory without any scalar fields, this is correct.